And so we'll continue on here in this, in this message. Uh, but what, one thing we talked about last week, and this is where I get myself in trouble, is when I start talking about what I've already talked about, because I know you weren't all here last week, right? And so I'd encourage you to go online if you want to get caught up in this series, and the title online will be the same as this one. Um, and maybe they'll put part two in there or something like that for those that are looking later on and if you're online. Uh, but we've been looking at Ephesians 1, 1 through 13, and now we're going into 14, 15, all the way to 23. And, and so I think it was so important for us to realize that our world is in an identity crisis, right? There's some challenges within, within the world we live in. And we talked about how it's important as, as a Christ follower... As a Christ follower, the things that, that we're called to do do not happen outside of our identity being in Christ Jesus. All right? That we have a new identity, and that's in Christ. And, and, and Paul does a fantastic job laying a foundation to the church in Ephesus how important it is to have our identity in Christ. And, and which really strips away our identity. And so it doesn't matter. This doesn't matter anymore. Now what matters is, is Jesus Christ. And, and we're going to hear something really unique. Well, Maybe we will because it's the last verse of this passage that I'm talking about, and I might not get there today. But the last verse, really, there, there's kind of an eye-opening thing that Paul says as he's praying for the church. Because what we have is we have this, this theological, you know, 13 verses that really lay a foundation for identity in Christ. And then we have these next few verses that are just encouraging, just Paul just kind of saying, hey, way to go, church. You know, this is what's going on. I'm praying for you for these things. And I, and I wanted just to kind of unpack that a little bit this morning because I think there's some, there, there's some things that I think as I'm reading through that, I would say, man, Lord God, let this be a prayer that we receive as a church in Lebanon, Oregon. That we say, even as, even as Paul's writing this, as he's saying this in his church in Ephesus, let this be true for us. Let this be something that, that, that resonates, resonates with us. And, and one thing, you know, just in, I'm going to be hopefully bouncing back and forth a little bit, but in relationship to, the, to our culture, I think it's so important that we understand um, what Christ did on the cross and what we're called to do, the commandments that God's calling us to do, and how those relate in relationship to the first commandment and the second commandment. Now, now I say that because I, I think we, we have some challenges, right, as a church within our culture, because we, we see things that are going on that maybe we don't like, and so it actually has an impact on how we relate to people that sin differently, believe differently, think differently than we do. And we have to be careful. It's interesting, because I was reading my devotions this morning, which is totally unrelated, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, in chapter, well, actually I was reading two, 3 and 4, and, and in there it talks about not judging, uh, about being careful not to judge. That, that we'll, leave, we'll leave that up to God at the end of time. And, and I think when we get... The, the first commission, I think I have a slide for this on here, is, and, and he says to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. I, 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 think, I think it's very important that we understand that this is the first commandment. That, that there's something important about it being first I think sometimes we can say there's these two commandments and we might see them as equally valuable. Now, I'm not saying they're not valuable, but I think for us to actually get the second commandment right, we have to get the first one right. I think we have to understand first and foremost that, our, that we are designed and we are created to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind. And then in the Old Testament, it even adds, and strength. Right? That these, these are things that we do as a, as a Christ follower. These are things that, that compel us as we're living life to make sure that, that God is first in our life. Now the challenge comes, right, is when we're dealing with, with our neighbor and, and our, that doesn't love the Lord our God, all right, or, or, or that is living life and we're saying, man, that doesn't really line up with what, what Christ would call us to as a Christ follower. And so then we have to say, well, how do we relate to that? All right, because I think that's one of the challenges is that I can love someone without approving of someone's actions. But it's challenging. It's something that, that we have to intentionally say, hey, I'm going to love them and see through what, what, what the Holy Spirit is doing and say my, my responsibility is to love them. And to wrap my arm around them. And while there are yet sinners, even as Christ died for them, so, me, so am I, as Christ did, so too. Am I going to say, hey, while there are yet sinners, I'm going to love them. 
And, and sometimes we want to, and I talked about this last week a little bit, about some things, and interesting that Joey talked about, right, the potter and the clay. That's one of the things last week that, that, I, that I talked about and mentioned, that just about understand that this is one of the things that when we talk about our identity, why we as a Christ follower, so assured an understanding that, that our identity belongs to him is because we recognize that I don't have the authority as a, as a potter to change my identity, to do things with my identity that don't reflect Christ. But yet we live in a world where people are struggling with that. And so how do we as the church, as the followers of Jesus Christ, love people no matter what they're going through? Man, church, that's one of those things that we've got to figure that out. We we, we have to be able to say, man, no matter what someone's going through, I'm going to love them through it. Knowing if we get this, right? If we get that God is the one that's over all things, that that he's the creator of everything, that means he's the creator of everything. I mean, I'm, I'm not... Am I going too fast? I mean, because I think we have to realize that if God is creating everything, that means everyone and everything is created by God. And and therefore, if God is the one over those things, then guess what I'm not in charge of? I'm not in charge of other people. Right? I'm not in charge of, uh, of saying you have to behave this way, you have to act this way. All I know is this, is when you, now I'm right in the middle of my message, which is, it's okay. Um, but but, but if, you, if you understand that, hey, when people get Jesus, when they truly get him, their lives will be transformed. Yes. That they're the ones, that God's the one that's going to change them, not you or me. What we're going to do is welcome into the family of God and say, hey, praise God, he's doing great things. We're not saying clean yourself up before you come in. Because guess what? If that's how we had to behave, this place would be pretty empty, right? Even even before you came in here this morning, if I said, hey, you got to make sure you have no sin in your life before we walk in the door, I'd probably still be outside, right? Because we all do stupid stuff, right? Say dumb things and act stupidly, behave stupidly, and we're tempted, we fall into something. And so we have to realize that God is, what's awesome about being a Christ follower is that Jesus is continually reminding us of the good news of what he has done. And so therefore, in the midst of whatever you're walking through, you say, God still got me. God's still dealing with me. He still loves me. Even though I just messed that up, just, just, just did some stupid stuff over here. But God loves me so much and he hasn't given up on me. He's not done with me. It's like when he's done with me is when he says, hey, come on home. Well, then, he's fin- then it's finished, right? I'm in heaven, perfected the body, everything, the mind, the, everything's perfected. But right now, I'm a bit jacked up, all right? Because I got this crazy flesh. And I talk enough about myself around here. You guys pray for my wife. Actually, my wife should have been one of these states, right? And you're like, someone pray for Kim for 30 days. Please change her husband, that he'll love her like he should. Um, but yet, in the midst of all that we're going, this is what my wife, this is why my wife stays with me, is because she knows that Jesus Christ is not done with me. She, she knows that, that there's still hope, that, hey, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it, even though sometimes she wonders if I'm going to get it, right? It's like, not again. Oh, no, no, here we go again. You know, but yet, that's the thing. I think so easily, you know, we, we could say, we, we could be around our family, be like, we're so forgiving, we're so loving, but then someone that is going through an identity crisis, we're going to be like, man, oh, there's no hope for them, there's no chance for them. Man, church, let that not be us. Let, let us not be that judgmental people that doesn't give Jesus, that doesn't give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to change lives. And, and guess what? There's no timeline. There's no sense of, well, you, you got 30 days. You know, you, you, got, you, got, you, got, you got till tomorrow. You got, I mean, if we like putting timelines on things, guess what? Our God doesn't have a calendar. He doesn't have a timeline. He's not a keeper of days. He's not up there counting. He's, he's infinite before and after. He's not bound by time like we are. Well, we're all so sensitive to what time it is. Oh, what have I done? It's like, live your life. Have a blast doing it. Let Jesus be first. And man, find yourself in the midst of, in moments where you let Christ shine through your life. And and just enjoy all that God has called us to. And it's amazing when that happens in our lives, all of a sudden we become less sensitive to the hurt, to to what other people are doing wrong. I I mean, I love the, when we see the parable about the, the speck, you know, the plank and the speck, and we recognize that, man, Believe it or not, that is oftentimes the church. The world sees it that way. They see the church as we're so judgmental. 
And man, I think as we, as we walk through an understanding of the challenges that we're facing, is that I pray that God give us a sensitivity to these challenges so we don't come across inappropriately. We don't come across in a way that's not pleasing or honoring to the Lord. Yet we stand for truth. Yet we, we hold on to the truth of scriptures and we're okay with, with, with communicating. And like I talked about last week, I gave us some, some scriptures to help us identify this is why we believe the way we believe. And to be able to communicate that without shame, without condemnation. You say, as a Christ follower, this is what I believe. And I love you regardless of what you believe. Because if we truly believe that God is, is in control of salvation, if salvation belongs to the Lord, well, then we can really just say, God, I'm going to be on my knees for this individual. I'm going to, I'm going to let Jesus be seen through me. I'm going to let, somehow let, let the gospel be evident I mean, just read the New Testament. Just read the, 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 the Gospels and, and just see how Jesus related to people and say, Lord God, help me to do that. I mean, it's so crazy. You know, when you read the Scripture, now obviously, if I was God, I'd probably do things a little bit differently. <laughs> right? I mean, come on, be honest with me. I mean, everybody is abandoning Jesus all the time. You know, I, I feel like Jesus should have done maybe more miracles or something else. or He could have done this and got more people saved and more people... But that wasn't his plan or his purpose. His purpose was to take these 12 people, minus one, add one, right? Matthias later on, but I mean, Judas. But, but you take these 12 people, and I, I'm teaching them because they're going to establish the church. They're going to establish us. And here we are some thousands of years later, and we are those disciples that Jesus sent into the world to be a light to the world, to be Christ in the world. And what was cool is that these guys, and this is maybe one of our challenges, is because we didn't sit with, there's so much, and the Bible even talks about in John, how you, you, don't, you don't have a, there's not enough volumes to contain all that were done, what Jesus did, right? And so we, we have this, this synopsis, which isn't really that big when we think of three, 33 and a half years or three and a half years, but, but to think about walking with Jesus and seeing what he did and then be challenged, Right? And our behavior to say, God, I, I saw you behave this way. God, help me to behave the same way towards the sinner, towards the prostitute, towards the adulterer, towards the whatever. You know, I mean, you look at wizards and different things that they're dealing with and demon-possessed people and, and you name it. And you watch how Jesus behaved and say, that, that really, I, I think, stuck with the disciples as they're walking this thing out, as they're reminded probably time and time again of what Jesus did. And I think this is what's so important about us getting into the Word, because it really is discovering Jesus. Discovering how Jesus lived his life, and then saying, Lord, I, I want to follow after you. As a Christ follower, I want to deny the things that I want to do, and we talked about this last week, and I want to do what you want to do. I, I, I'm going to pick up my cross, whatever it might be, and I'm going to carry it for Jesus, because I understand that as a follower, that's what I am, a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm not trying to create some new... You know, Christology, I'm not trying to create something different for the world to see because, boy, if Jesus would have done this a little differently, it would have been better. No, he did exactly what needed to be done for people to come back into relationship with the Father. And, and we're to mimic who Christ is. We're to be Christ on the earth. And it's awesome just to have that responsibility to actually carry that message, carry that message forward. And so here we have in this passage of scripture, okay, I'm going to try to find out where in the world I am here, as I'm just all over the place. Um, our culture, like I said, let's see, is this, is it, this isn't buzzing on me, so it's not moving, which I don't know if it's, Holly, do you want to move the screen ahead? I, I got a, froze, a frozen wand here. Um, in Matthew, okay, there we go. So, let me go back here. Okay, the second's like it. So in Ephesians, Ephesians 1, so, so here, here's the verses we're in, all right, in Ephesians 1, 15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. I, I love that passage of scripture because he's sharing something here, and, and we talked about this a few weeks, actually in the very beginning of this series, about how in Ephesus there was this agape love that they had towards the people, and then we read in Revelation when it says that they've They've forgotten or they've lost that sense of, of love that they had at first. Their first love, they've lost that. That is that agape love. And, and, and to recognize that it was generations that followed that actually no longer had that same love they had in the beginning. And, 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 I've, and we talked about how, how important it is as, as individuals that we're not just living for ourselves, but we're actually 
responsible for the next generation. That we should be raising up the next generation to understand what it, to not lose a sense of what it is to agape one another. To truly have a passion for one another, a desire for one another. Agape is, is simply this. When used in the Bible, it refers to a pure, willful, sacrificial love that intentionally desires another's highest good. It's that, it's that pure, willful, sacrificial love. It's something that, that, that isn't about me. It's not about I love you because you better love me back. It, it, it's a love that is truly laying my life down. Now, not just a friendship, hey, I love you. It, it's, it's not, I mean, don't we all do this now? Whenever you text someone, love you. That's not the kind of love I'm talking about. We're just throwing the, the word love out there like, hey, I love, I love donuts. I love my wife. I love... We put it all together, like that's all the same. It's not, right? My love for my wife is not me loving hostess pies, though it's awfully close. All right, right. I mean, it's not, it's it's not that, it's not the same, honey, it's not the same, all right? uh, My love for my wife is very, it's much deeper, it's sacrificial. It's that sense of it's not about me, it's about her. And they've lost that. Right? But here in the beginning of this, it says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints. Is that he was just rejoicing with them. He'd heard of their love, which is an expression, an outward expression, something visible that was going on. He heard of it because it's evident that you love people, that you love one another. I think that's an encouraging thing for us to say, man, I want that for us too, right? I would say, man, God, let us be a church that loves our neighbors that agapes them, that loves them unconditionally, or with a sense of saying, hey, it's not about me, it's sacrificially, willfully, with a pure heart. So I'm, I'm gonna love you, I'm gonna care, I'm gonna care for you. He goes on in verse 16. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Now, obviously, this is pretty cool, right? I mean, here's Paul's writing. And he's saying, hey, I'm, I, I remember you, I'm, I'm remembering you in my prayers. He's not the kind of person that walks up to you and you tell him something and you go, hey, I'll be praying for you. And then what do we do? Then we go away and we forget to pray for them, right? I mean, has that ever happened to anybody? Yeah, yeah. And so this is what I'd encourage you to do. Here's how I, I, I would solve this. And I do this many times. Is, as someone's telling me about what they're going through, I just say, hey, let's pray for that right now. Because I know myself well enough that unless I write it down, it's going, to be, it's going to get in this gray matter up here and it's not going to make sense in about five minutes and I'm going to think of something else, right? A squirrel or something. It's like it's going to distract me. So in that moment, just stop and go, hey, I'm on the phone. Hey, let's just pray about that. Let's just stop right now. Let's just pray for this. I mean, I'm going to try to remember to pray for you later. I'll put it in my journal, but right now, let's just pray for this. And I love that Paul is just saying, hey, I do not cease to give thanks to you, remembering you in my prayers. So be encouraged, church. Encourage the Ephesus, the church in Ephesus, that, hey, I'm, I'm praying for you. I'm remembering, I'm remembering you. And then he says this, and then he says that, he's praying this. He gives some description of what he's praying for. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, here's where I can go sideways, right? Because when it talks about the Father of glory, it, it just, it rocks my world a bit. And we, we, I talked about this actually a number of years ago, just what this means, his glory. Because it, it's the essence, it's the evidence, it's the expression, it's the display of who our God is. It's this amazing picture, this magnitude of, of explosion of all that God is to us and in his very character, his very person of, of who he is. And it's seen in Christ Jesus, it's seen in the Father, it's seen in the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's amazing just to, just to recognize, here he is talking about the Father of glory. And I just wrote down some things. When I just think about the Father of glory, the, 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 God, the God of grace, the God of mercy, his steadfast love and faithfulness, his ever, he's an ever-present Father whose strength is seen in our weaknesses. A forgiving and forgetting father. He chooses to forget. He forgives and then he forgets. And, and this is one of the things as fathers, right? If you want to say, hey, I, I, want, I, want, to, I want to be like, be like Christ and be like the father. It's like, how do I do a better job when someone sins against me to forget about it? To actually forgive the individual and then forget about it. That's the glory of our father. How he doesn't hold it to our account. He removes the debt. 
He doesn't keep the debt in play and keep reminding us, hey, you still owe me. Hey, you still owe me. Hey, remember that time when you did that against me? Hey, remember that time when you're in an argument six months later, you're bringing back something to say, hey, remember when you did that? And that's not helpful as you're moving forward. And our father, he forgives and then chooses to forget it. Talked about in Revelation, as far as the east is from the west, he removes it from us. Because sometimes we read the scripture and we maybe have walked through some situations where our father wasn't so grand, wasn't so helpful. Maybe on the other side, he was hurtful. I, I've not done everything right. And, and I would hope as, as my kids would look at the word of God that they would see something amazing about our heavenly father. And it's not that they have to say, oh, I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking to see if my dad is, is like God. I realize, you know, my dad's never gonna be like our heavenly father. He's gonna make mistakes. He's imperfect. He's going to have problems. But that doesn't change my perspective of who our Heavenly Father is. So many times in talking to individuals that are just struggling with, with relational things, that they, and even, even their relationship with, the, with their Heavenly Father is because they've had an earthly father that's painted a very different picture for them. And that they don't really know their Heavenly Father. And so they assume that this is what a father behaves like. Whereas this is the importance of getting, and, and Paul actually shares this a little bit later on, about getting to know our Heavenly Father, because then, no matter what we're going through, we find our security in our Father in Heaven, and it allows our Father on Earth to be okay if they're jacked up a little bit, because they're not our Heavenly Father. Their Father is still imperfect, working through stuff, and I can forgive them. I can love them through it. I can walk alongside with them. I don't have to judge them that are not being perfect. I recognize, hey, I don't need you to be perfect because my heavenly father is. Amen. And, and, and to actually realize that as you're look, reading through scripture is helping us define what a father is. He's also one who sustains life. The author of all things. In Psalms 93, he's mightier than the waves in the sea. Our father is just and right 100% of the time. That's who our Heavenly Father is. That's seeing His glory, the one that will make all things new. It says, The Father of glory may give you, it says here, the spirit of wisdom and of revelation. It says, The spirit of wisdom and of revelation may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Now, what's interesting, I, I was looking at different translations, and some of them have the word spirit capitalized, and others have it a lowercase. And I think when, when I read through this, I don't think Paul is talking about, you know, saying, you know, to give you the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit cam comes at salvation, that we have the Holy Spirit. But what he's talking about is a spirit that comes from the Holy Spirit, a spirit of, of wisdom, a spirit of understanding, a spirit of revelation in the knowledge of him, is that we need the Holy Spirit, which does what? It illuminates, talks about in John, illuminates all truth. The Holy Spirit leads us into truth. The truth is who? Jesus Christ. And so we understand that the Holy Spirit is going to point us to the gospel. It's going to point us to the good news of who Jesus Christ is. And, and so therefore, when, when Paul is praying for the church, that the spirit of wisdom and of revelation may come upon us, you know, in the knowledge of him, is that knowing him is truly the key to understanding how, how, how we can live life and walk this thing out knowing our Heavenly Father, knowing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That we actually understand and have a relationship with the Godhead. Because once we know Him, it's one of those things that, that you, you don't want to close that door anymore. You, you actually just want more of Him. And, want, and that, that's what getting into the Word is so important. You know, as Paul is praying here, come to the knowledge of him. You know, I had to stop and think, well, how do we do that? Well, you know, we're reading the word, right? Where we're in prayer. Walk, keep it in step, as it talks about in Galatians 5. Walking with the Spirit. Keep it in step with the Spirit in verse 23. Just that understanding that, that hey, we're supposed to be walking this out on a daily basis. In the word, knowing him and understanding him. That, that, that as, as we're doing that, there's a sense of saying, man, when I know him, it's like I can't, I don't want to unknow him anymore. And then all of a sudden when something comes along and tries to paint a different picture of who our God is, we say, well, no, 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 I, I, I know him. It's like if someone came to me and said something bad about my wife, 
Who am I going to believe? Am, am, am I going to, because here's the thing is, I know my wife. I, I know her personality. I know her character. I, I know how she thinks and how she do, makes decisions and things. If someone comes and says something very different, I, I, I'd be very slow just to go, oh, wow, I can't believe my wife did that. Oh, that's terrible. She's such a mean person. I, I just can't believe. That's not what I'm, I'm going to say to you. I'm going to say, well, that's interesting. Do you know my wife? And they're like, well, not, not really, not, not too good. But you know what? I heard this. It's like, okay, but you don't know her? Well, well, no, I don't really know her. It's like, so what, the, what are you talking about? Because, okay, so come with me. I, I want you to come and meet my wife. Because when you get to know her, when you get to know her, you'll realize, hey, what people say about, if, if that person said that, you say, oh, that's not true. I think that the challenge is, is when people in the world we live in say something negative about our Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, when we go, oh, really? Okay, well, yeah, okay, yeah, that, that could be true. It's because you just don't know him. It's because we haven't spent time in the Word of God. We haven't spent time on our knees. We haven't spent time walking with the Spirit every day, allowing ourselves to build this relationship to actually be able to go, hey, that's not true. Because the devil's a liar. So there's a lot of lying going on out there about who our God is. And actually coming across like, because you're a Christian, you're going to behave this way, act differently. It's like, wait a minute. My God loves you while you're sinning. So that's not who my God is. Oh, if your God is this, what does he do? It's like, you don't know him, and yet you're saying terrible things about him. And I think that's where we come to the understanding. As people get to know him, it's going to transform them. It's going to change the way they think, the way they believe. So, it, oh, how are we doing here? Okay, 11, I got a little bit of time. I got like 11 minutes. All right, hang on. Get, let me get a swig of water. You know what's funny? Is that, you know how you can listen to people online? You can speed them up a little bit? I notice when you speed me up, it's, it's not audible anymore. Because I'm already talking so fast. It's like you, okay, and I think you can slow it down too. So maybe some of you do that. When you listen to it again, you like slow that guy down because he gets going. When the problem, and the reason I do that is because I just get going on other things. And then I feel like I, I, and 45 minutes is not enough time to share everything. But fortunately, we, we, some of you come back next week. Not all of you. But, oh, now my phone's talking to me. But, but regardless, it, it's like, you know, God, God's going to say something during this time that's going to stick with you. Not everything. I know that. I, I, too many words are coming out of my mouth. Right? You're not going to remember everything. But I'm okay with that. All right? Because the Holy Spirit is one that's there with you. That's going to illuminate truth to you. That's going to actually, hopefully, you're saying, hey, let's look what Warren said. Is that in the Bible? Does that match? Okay, it does. Oh, it doesn't. <clears throat> Throw that stuff out. You know, whatever it is, there's things that God's speaking to you today that he wants us to carry forward, to actually add it to our repertoire. Add it to how we live life, how we do marriage, how we raise kids, how we, how we live in our community, how we deal with people that, that are different than we are. That God wants to speak some things to us when every time we gather together. I mean, every time. That's why it's like, I, I value so much our times together because I know that God's going to say, do something when we come together. I, I, I don't even, it's not even an expectation. It's what I know. Because I've seen it time and time again in many of your own lives. Because you guys talk to me afterwards and during the week. And it's like, oh, that was God did this during worship or during that word or during. It's like, oh, that's, that's why we gather together. Because this is the body of Christ coming together to be the body of Christ in the world we live in. And we, we haven't arrived. We, 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 <laughs> we, we do things that are like, woo cuckoo sometimes. But yet God in the midst of all that, his grace and love for us is ever present in our lives. One thing he says here in verse 18, I just love this. He says, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. So he just finished saying, he said, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. And I just love the image of this. When I think about our hearts, and I'm reminded of... Um, Right when I first read this, I'm reminded of Job, right? Because Job said, you know, I had heard of you. And does anybody not know the story of Job? I don't want to get into that, but I encourage you to read those 42 chapters. I've heard of you by the hearing of your ears, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. If something happened that his eyes were open. And, and I love just the reference here that the eyes of your hearts are enlightened. Because here's the thing, is that God is the one that opens the eyes of the hearts. 
that enlightens people to truth. And, and so when, when you're with people that, that are not Christians living however they're living, it's like, it's like our prayer is that, you know, some, somewhere in the, in the course of their existence, the eyes of their hearts will be enlightened. That their eyes will be opened up to understand and to know who our God is. You know, there's a, a song that we sung a lot when, we were, when I was younger. But it's that, Open the Eyes of Our Heart, Lord. Do you remember that song? It goes, Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love. As we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I mean, I, I was, as I was just, as that verse came and I was thinking, man. I love that song. I was just saying, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. Because here's the thing. The heart, if God can get your heart, buckle up. Right? Because here's the thing. I mean, I'm back to my wife. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> I'll buy you something nice. I don't know. Um, but when my wife... When, uh, uh, when my wife got my heart, when we weren't just friends anymore, but I fell in love with her, that she had my heart, it changed the game, yeah. right? I mean, when all of a sudden there was that heart connection that we had with one another, yeah. it elevated her to a place above every woman on the planet. Yeah. Didn't matter. Didn't matter what others would say or do, how others looked or acted or whatever, is that, is that she became something significant in my life. You know, there, sometimes there's times, you know, with her and I, and as we're just doing life, and, and I'll just send her a text and said, I have a lot of love in my heart for you right now. And, and it's an expression, and it does something to me, and I think it, it helps her too, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, no, I do. But, but it's, that, it's that sense of no matter what we're going through. So sometimes you'll face challenges and you'll stop and go, oh man, I just love my wife and I need to let her know it. Sometimes I'll be driving in the car and I'll be praying or whatever and sometimes I just turn to the Lord and say, man, I just, I just love you so much right now that you took me a wretched sinner with all my faults and all my, and you knew you knew all the imperfect things I was going to do up until right now at this date in my life. And yet you still called me out of darkness and named me and called me your own. And I'm just like overwhelmed by your love and that my heart belongs to you. I think some of the challenge for people, even in the church, young people growing up, is they never truly give their heart to the Lord. They're still holding back. They're not being vulnerable, not being transparent. They're not allowing God in and dealing with everything. And so then when something comes along, all of a sudden the motivation of our heart changes. And we think, oh, God didn't do this for me. Therefore, God's not. And how all of a sudden we find ourselves within a relationship with the Lord, just putting it aside because a certain expectation or certain something happened or a certain desire came up and we all of a sudden we give ourselves into something that's not, not what God wants for us. And how God wants our hearts, he wants to open the eyes of our heart to enlighten us to truly who he is, truly what he has done. Because then, here's the thing, is, is once you have the heart, then it doesn't matter. I mean... In my life, I mean, my wife's with me not because I've been perfect in our marriage. It's because I have her heart. She loves me regardless. That she's with me through no matter whatever. So many times within relationships and as we see people get divorced because of certain things. And I know some of us have gone through for reasons that are awful, you know, had to be separated. But, but too many times in the world we live in, we throw that away so quickly because there truly really never was that sense of, hey, my heart now belongs to you. 
And then we wonder why. And then we wonder why people leave the church or leave their relationship with the Lord or backslide, whatever, whatever, whatever you want to call it. And we recognize that, man, they never, they never truly understand what it was to give their heart to the Lord, to really fall in love with him. And so much of that is that sense of knowing him and the sense of prayer that Paul is praying for the church right now is that sense of as you get to know him, you get to understand him, that the wisdom and, and revelation of who our God is and knowing him is once we get that, it's like, man, nothing can steal that away from us. The heart impacts the entire body. Stand with me this morning. Please. Mm -hmm. I'm going to close this time. And and, and as I do, I'm going to give you an opportunity. If you need prayer this morning, and and there might be some things, I mean, whether, whatever you're going through. I just just felt, because it, as, as I change here in this next verse, it changes a bunch, and I don't want to necessarily do that right this second. I just want to pause here for a moment. Because I, I just, I, I wonder sometimes if we kind of are, are, are just okay with the heart relationship we have with the Lord, but yet we know it's not truly what you want. But you're kind of just saying, hey, I'm just kind of, this is just what it is. And now, now maybe it's even in your marriage, it's like, oh, it just, it is what it is. And not really thinking, God wants it to be more. God wants to blow it up in such a way that, they're, that you're ravenous towards each other. That you just love being with each other. You're, you're passionate. You're intimate. That, that, you, have, you, that, that you, you can't wait to be together. That you want to spend time with one another. He wants that in your relationships. He wants that in the relationship you have with him. He, he wants us to be all in, that there's no, there's no questioning the motivation of the person that I'm married to. There's no questioning the motivation of the Father, the God that, that, that has called me by name, that has taken me out of darkness and made me his very own. And that this morning, if you're saying, man, I, I, I just want prayer for this. I, I, I just want to just to say, whatever, whatever it is that you're going through, that you just want prayer for that. I want you just to come up here. And, and, I, and I want to pray for, for you this morning, okay? Also, as we close, if, if you want to make Jesus Lord, if you, if you don't know Jesus, and you say, man, I, I, I'm hearing these stories, but I don't even know him, and, and you want to begin that first step, come up here and we'll pray with you. And we'll just say, hey, here's, it's not rocket science. It's just simply confessing with your mouth and saying, I'm, I want to make Jesus Lord of my life. I don't know what that even, you, you might not even know what that looks like. But that's okay, because we have a great amount of people here that know what it looks like, would love to walk with you through it as you're discovering what it is to make Jesus Lord of your life. It may be that you're saying, hey, uh, the, the Holy Spirit, the walking with the Holy Spirit, I don't understand that. Maybe you've been baptized and filled in the Spirit. Maybe you haven't. But say, man, I want, I want to be full of the Holy Spirit every day. But I, I, want, I want to be prayed over to be filled in the Holy Spirit. And that happens today as well. And I'd encourage you to come up here. Why don't you play some music of some kind, just so there's music playing. And I'm going to pray. I'm going to dismiss you. Uh, If you want to come up and get prayer for, for just that renewing of the heart, the strength of the heart. If you want to get prayer, say, hey, man, I'm going to make Jesus Lord. Or if you say, I want the Holy Spirit just to empower me, just to fill me up to overflow. Because the reason why we're filled up is to be a witness, is to be empowered by the Holy Spirit with all kinds of amazing things that God's given us to impact our world that we live in. So, so Lord God, right now, we just thank you for your church. Thank you for your people this morning. God, as we're gathered here together, Lord, I pray this is an opportunity just to respond, that, that maybe there's things people have been walking through and, and, they, and they don't even think that, God, you're aware of it or even care about it. That, God, that you want our hearts. You want to open the eyes of our hearts to know you, to love you. And, and God, this morning, we want to pray for people Lord, that, that just say, hey, I, I, I need a heart change. I, and I don't care who's in the room. I, I know what I need, and I need a heart change. I need God to do something in my heart right now. And I'm not okay with just keep on going the way I'm going. I, I just pray, God, you just illuminate something amazing and enlighten me, Lord God, to what you have for me. And God, we just give this to you. We thank you so much that you're with us today. 
Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We look forward to every time we gather together. We look forward throughout the week in community and ministry groups and whatever's going on this week. We just thank you, God, that you're with us in all that we do. We praise you in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Hello, everyone. Thanks for watching this YouTube video. Hope we've already done this, but if not, hit the like, subscribe, ring the bell. We'd love to stay connected with you. This is a great way if you're out and about to make sure you remain part of what we're doing here at the River Center. There'll be another great video next week. So check it out and hopefully we'll see you soon. Thanks.